we actually found that people who don't reciprocate in these experiments, don't reciprocate at all, you give them money they save the whole thing, so those are unconditional non-reciprocators. No, that's a lot of symbols. What do we really call them? We call them bastards. My name is Paul Zak. I'm a professor of economics at Claremont Graduate University in Southern California. I direct the Center for Neuroeconomic Studies, which is a lab that studies human behaviors in the brain. So neuroeconomics can be thought of looking at the brain basis for decision making. Ah, what does that mean? It's really about why people make bad decisions regarding money. So our lab looks at the brain basis for decision making, and those decisions are very broadly understood, including decisions involving other people. Why would you ever help someone? when you don't have to? Why would you ever be generous or trustworthy? So these are some of the issues that we look at that underpin modern economies. So if you think about how we live as human beings, we're constantly navigating through a sea of strangers. We are not just social creatures, we're hyper-social creatures. Most animals like to be around only their own offspring, only their own family unit, or at most, their kind of small clan-based group. We actually like living around individuals, we like living in big cities, New York, LA, so if we're doing that, we must have some mechanism that balances appropriate levels of trust and distrust. We showed in 2005 that when you receive money denoting trust, your brain releases a chemical called oxytocin. And oxytocin motivates you to reciprocate. It makes us feel empathy for others, it connects us to others, and it motivates this reciprocal behavior. Currently, I call oxytocin the moral molecule. So we found through um, I don't know, 20 or 30 studies we've done in the lab, Narcissism motivates a variety of moral behaviors, trustworthiness, generosity, compassion, forgiveness. So it does that by drawing on this physiology of love. We've shown recently that um, physiology of love for offspring, bonding to our mates, in a human brain has now been expanded to include uh, care for complete strangers. So David Hume, the philosopher, had this idea of circles of empathy. He talked about having most empathy for those around us, our family, our friends, and less for people further away. We found is that oxytocin, in fact, has a very broad circle of empathy. Certainly, we care about our family and our friends more than anybody else, but this mechanism is so general purpose and is so uh, put into high gear in human beings that, in fact, we care about complete strangers. When I was a kid, there used to be lots of media coverage of some kid who fell down a well in Texas. Will he survive? He's got a broken leg. Thought experiment. Let's suppose we calf the well. The kid will stop crying in a little while, right? So we save the two million bucks that we'll spend, you know, going down there, building some apparatus to pull this kid out. And we use the two million bucks and we vaccinate every child in Mississippi, Louisiana, West Virginia. We'll save hundreds and hundreds of lives. Why don't we trade that one life for the 200 lives in Virginia, et cetera? We can't do that, right? Because when we hear those cries of that child, you feel yourself there. We have empathy for that. We can't shut that off. So even though from a sort of pure utilitarian perspective, yes, give up one life to save 200, that's much better. But it's one particular life and 200 statistical lives, other lives are not going to see. So the way the brain is set up as social creatures, we can't ignore the pleas of that one person. This is really interesting because that, in fact, is the basis for trade. Trade is one person asking for something, another person giving it to them. So in the book I just finished, The Moral Markets, uh, we find that in fact trade depends on morality because it's that care for the other. It's the same kind of brain mechanism. So markets depend on morality for three reasons. One, humans are inveterate traders. We can't help it. We've always traded. You help me, I help you. You give me goods, I give you money. And as I said earlier, trade is really an other regarding behavior. It depends on virtue because I have to give you money, you have to give me a good. Occasionally, there are bad people in the world, or there are situations in which we push the limit and people behave immorally. So just because there are a couple of Bernie Madoffs out there doesn't take away from the dry cleaner who for free sews your buttons on, or the clerk at Walmart who goes to 50 different places to help you find a toothbrush. Those things are happening all the time, and they're part of our human nature. They're part of our evolved sociality from which trade depends. So that's number one. Uh, the second reason is that there's actually good evidence now from aboriginal societies, from small-scale societies, that the extent of trade motivates moral behaviors in laboratory experiments. So what trade tells us is that there are win-win solutions. Right? It's not more for me, less for you. Most of trade is about you benefiting and me benefiting. I made this little widget, 
and you're willing to pay, pay me more than I had to spend to make it. Uh, you need the widget, I need the money, boom, we're a win. Um, it seems like in these small scale societies that people have understood that trade is about a win-win solution and that's held over and actually made them in some sense more moral, at least more pro-social in these experiments involving exchanges of money, the kind of things that we do and measure oxytocin for. So the third reason is that your brain is very lazy. So I like to say your brain's a lazy Republican. So it's a Republican because it's conservative. It tries to conserve energy. It does things on autopilot. Once you've learned it, it becomes a default pattern. It's lazy because it refocuses, it reuses mechanisms that were originally developed for one purpose for another. It doesn't want to recreate the wheel, too expensive. So in this lazy Republican brain, it takes the, the physiology of care for offspring, the hallmark of mammals using oxytocin, and expands that circle out to include complete strangers. Again, modifying or modulating trust and distrust at appropriate level. So once we learn something, this becomes instantiated in the brain, becomes a bias, because this lazy brain doesn't want to have to rethink. Oh, here's a new guy, what do I do? It says, oh, what's my default behavior? If 98% of the individuals are trustworthy, which is exactly what we find in our laboratory experiments, 98% of people when you trust them reciprocate, then that's my default. I expect people to reciprocate. It means 2% of the time I'm wrong, I'm going to be cheated. So 2% is about the proportion of sociopaths in the uh, population. But we actually found that people who don't reciprocate in these experiments, don't reciprocate at all. You give them money, they save the whole thing. So those are unconditional non-reciprocators. No, that's a lot of symbols. What do we really call them? We call them bastards. Right? These are people, you send them money, you know you're giving up money to help them. This money grows in size and they keep the whole thing. So these individuals have a dysregulation in oxytocin. They have very high levels of oxytocin. They don't turn this switch on and off. Oxytocin is a quick on-off switch. These guys always have this switch stuck. We actually find that they have unusual uh, social behaviors. They think deception's okay. They're also self-deceptive. They don't really know what they're going to do themselves. They're kind of in survival mode because that's how they get through the world. They simulate this behavior. So it's going to be hard to identify them. So again, the Bernie Madoffs, not surprising. We're going to have some of those people in the world. This is a good thing. Bernie Madoff is very useful. Why? Because it tunes our brains and that we're just saying, oh, well, it's 98%. Well, why should I even care? You actually need that small proportion of non-reciprocators, of bastards, so that we understand that these people are in the world. Moral markers does not mean all markets at all times and all people are moral. It means I can design structures that draw in our innate human nature, which is moral, this moral molecule, so that markets depend on morality. Um, I think there's a middle ground in which you understand that human nature has its innate moral sense, and yet markets also need the freedom to evolve. And evolution, in any sense, in animals and bacteria and markets, means that mistakes will be made. And we have to be comfortable with imperfection. So moral markets mean that, by and large, if we allow, if we set in place rules that depend on our own human nature, which is innately moral and reciprocal, then those markets will flourish because they allow us to do what we love to do, which is trade with other individuals. Will the 2% of bastards appear? For sure. And we want to have rules to slam these people. And we do. Madoff, Skilling, Kenneth Lay, Ivan Bosky, uh, Michael Milken, go through the list. Why do we remember them? Because they're spectacular blobs and also because they're rare. What I don't know is the name of my dry cleaner who I picked up my laundry from this morning. I don't know the lady at Walmart who checked me out yesterday because they did their job right. Right? So I don't need to know them. That's the beauty of markets. If everything runs well, you can be anonymous. I don't need a top-down designer to tell everyone what to do. We know what to do. If I'm doing something wrong, I'm going to know about it pretty soon because we're social creatures. We don't do things in isolation. And again, we have, in modern societies, we have mechanisms to punish those people who go outside the bounds of what we think is acceptable. Um, so I think this resonates with libertarians because it says we are not evil as human beings. We actually are, have lots of good in us. And this good can come out in charitable work, in helping our neighbors, and in fact in markets. Markets are pro-social. Markets are about serving the needs of another. Right? That is innately virtuous. We don't need someone to tell us to do that. It happens very naturally. And yet it takes, markets take this innate moral nature and make it a win-win solution for everybody. Mm -hmm.